Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Welcome to another episode of Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow, and I'm so happy you're here. Friends, it's been a week. We took a week off of the podcast, and the reason that we took a week off of the podcast is really because of the exact topic that we're covering today. So in today's podcast, we are going to be talking about efficiency. And really, it has nothing to do with special education advocacy, but then again, it has everything to do with special education advocacy. Because I think special education advocacy is a lifestyle. I think that my family having Jack Barlow, who has Down syndrome, and who takes a little bit of extra time, a little bit of an up the ante factor, is a lifestyle. I don't think that we can tease out the appointments and the um, checking the, the labs for the blood work and the emails to the teacher and the um, <clears throat> uh, different advocacy as it applies to just spelling tests. I don't think we can tease those things out and say, okay, right now I'm going to be the mom of a little guy that needs a little bit more attention. Similarly, I don't think that we can tease out carpools and college applications and things that might only be attendant to my Griffin who has typical abilities and typical needs. I think it's all one big, beautiful mess because truly Griffin might need a little bit of medical advocacy too. Jack might need a little bit of carpooling too. And so it's all just kind of this give and take, this wax and wane, this ebb and flow. And what we are trying to do is just make it through each day. But in my world, I'm not just trying to make it through each day, I'm trying to make it through each day and also be incredibly effective. I want to make an impact both in my own life and in my children's lives and my family's entire life, all of us together. But then I also want to make an impact in my career with my friends as a sister, as a um, very novice runner. I want to continue to do well in many aspects of my life. And so this idea of efficiency comes up for me often. How do I do it all? Now, here's the funny thing, and and I'm just looking at a visual as I'm looking at myself on the video screen. And so I'm going to tell you something about efficiency, and we're going to come back to this visual here in a second. If you're not listening on YouTube and you want something funny, you might hop over to YouTube for the punchline that I just noticed. So I sometimes get um, a little, not offended, but like, I I sometimes feel like people don't have the right idea about me because oftentimes, maybe a few times a year, somebody will say, oh my gosh, how do you do it all? You are so put together. And I think I am the least put together person in the universe. If you saw my purse, um, now today my purse is organized because I switched purses because I had a funeral to go to and I thought people might judge my, my, my messy purse. So I just took the important things and put it in a new purse. But I have a purse out in my garage that is full of receipts and wrappers and socks and random pieces of toys that Jack has brought along. Probably some food, maybe a chapstick without the lid on it. It is messy and it is really kind of even disgusting. In my car, I have this kind of like image of us driving down the street and like 
receipts hanging out of the doors and like streaming in the wind and maybe the tailgate even open with um you know a couple of moldy swim team towels and um <clears throat> french fries and whatnot just kind of streaming out of our car and so the kind of underlying tone here is efficiency is the key to all of this and you really have to kind of like Pick your battles even as it comes to efficiency. I truly don't think that I could get nearly as much done in life if I was also trying to keep my car immaculate and if I also took the time every single day to empty out my purse of the random contents that get dropped in there because I have no place to put a half-eaten stick of chapstick after Jack chomps off a half of the stick or um, the pen that explodes on me when I'm in court and I just drop it in there and think, okay, well, we'll deal with that later. So I don't have the time to do those things because I'm making the time to do other things. And so I do think that's part of efficiency is not sweating the small stuff. So that takes us to the visual on the <laughs> on the YouTube feed here. And it is the garbage can in my office. I'm trying to point to it, but I didn't go to school for communication, so I can't get there. Okay, so the garbage can in my office is overflowing. It has a Chick-fil-A cup and a Chipotle cup, which might be one secret to my efficiency eating out. Um, and it has a calendar that I thought I was going to use, and it turns out I like paper calendars, so I just shoved it in there and pitched it. Um, and it's overflowing. The point is, I didn't take out my garbage when it got to the top of the basket because it wasn't on my radar that day. And so that's probably Friday's garbage that needs to be taken out. And so that, my friends, is why I get a little bit, I, I think really I get offended, which is maybe an emotion I should probably work on. But I feel so was misunderstood when people think that I have everything together because I don't. However, I do accomplish quite a bit and I know that objectively and I want to share some of the tips with you. I want to share some of my efficiency tips with you because it's December and I know that you have a lot going on. I have a lot going on and I really can accomplish a lot. And so I want to help you to be able to accomplish a lot as well. Okay, and no particular order, here is my list. So the first one is grocery delivery. Now, I learned a lot about my efficiency during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reason why I had to be more efficient was because we made a very difficult decision, but we were basically... Um, uh, what's that voluntold? <laughs> we were basically told that we had no choice but to um, keep our family home during COVID because Jack had some weird labs going on. He was going to be super duper vulnerable to COVID if he had gotten it in the very beginning. Um, and so we were home. And we also were told that we could not bring anybody else into our house. So we could have no childcare unless they chose to quarantine with us. And we didn't have anybody that was able to do that. And so we had, so I and my husband had to work our normal lives and our, our normal jobs and do our normal things. And then we also had to educate Jack. We had to facilitate his learning and his online learning platform. Um, and then Jack, at one point I counted up all of the people that interact with Jack in the course of a week and excluding his um his just like group of peers, his is like 22 kids in his class. Um, but including, you know, a, a couple of best friends that he definitely saw every single week for play dates and that kind of thing. I think we came up with over 30 people. And so I then had to play the role not only of general education teacher, special education teacher, PT, OT, speech therapist, swim team coach, um, fourth grade boy best friend that laughed at, at jokes about gas and that kind of thing. Um, but I also had to come up with a bunch of those activities because we didn't want for him to lose um, a lot of steam in his um, physicality or in his reading or those sorts of things. 
And so I had to teach Jack, I had to play with Jack, I had to cook all of our meals because we didn't eat out for quite some time. Um, the cleaning was a different kind of cleaning because of course we all thought COVID, or a lot of us thought COVID lived on surfaces still, blah, 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 blah. I had all this new stuff on my plate and it was different stuff, but it was additional stuff. Um, and so one of the things that we learned very quickly was we could save time, quote unquote, with grocery delivery. <clears throat> now I want to say something about grocery delivery. I honestly don't think that it saves me a whole lot of minutes, but it is more efficient and I want to tell you how. So I don't, um, I, it takes me about an hour to get through the grocery store. I usually go on Sundays if I physically walk my body into a grocery store. Um, and it takes me about an hour, honestly, to order groceries because I do think the apps are still a little clunky. Like you have to type something in, you have to find it, you have to click on it, click on your quantity, and then you have to delete all of that and almost like start all over and then type in the next item and do that over and over and over again. So it's a little inefficient. Um, what I learned fairly quickly was I could make lists. So I started making different grocery lists for different kinds of weeks. Um, and so I have a list of the things that we eat weekly. Our breakfast meat, yes, my kids do have a hot breakfast every morning. Um, our breakfast meat, our drinks, our, the fruits that we get every single week, um, the ingredients for my smoothies, a pound of turkey, those kinds of things so that I could just do add this entire list and then sure I can click out of things that we don't need, um, but that seemed to really help. I have another list of maybes. And so I add that list in and same thing, it's way easier to unclick the things that we don't need that week. Um, but if I know that it's going to be a heavier week, like we need olive oil or um, buttermilk, we tend to, I make I make our salad dressings and so, you know, every two or three weeks we need another, another half gallon of buttermilk. And so if I know that we need six or eight things on that list that's maybe 25, then I'll just add that entire list to my um, cart and then I can just delete the things that I don't need. And so I think that is where the efficiency lies in grocery delivery. You still have to put them away, you still have to carry them in from your front door. But I do think if you can make a whole list that then you just plop into your cart, it saves a little bit of time. So grocery delivery is something I learned during COVID. Now, something that I didn't learn during COVID, <clears throat> um, but something that I have always done, I think literally since I had um, children at the very first, and maybe before that, I don't know. I was in law school when we got married, so I had to be fairly efficient in order to fit it all in, um, is a weekly plan. So I plan out our week every single Sunday morning. And if I don't get to do it on Sunday, we all feel incredibly lost. So usually by Tuesday, I've sat down and just cranked it out quickly because we need this weekly plan. So what I do is I sit down with my cup of coffee and my iPad and my grocery app and a, just a piece of loose leaf paper and a pencil. And I write down Sunday through Saturday, leave a couple of spaces in between each. Then I look at our calendar and I write down everything. Now we also have a calendar in our kitchen and that calendar in our kitchen is like our Bible. So I write down all of our practice times, all of our therapy times, all of our social events, any, um, thing where mom or dad has to work early or late because that might um, entail a little bit of coverage from the other parent or grandparent or babysitter. Um, I write down any babysitter. So is my mom coming? Is a babysitter coming? Does Griffin need to cover a couple of hours? Um, I write down if we know Griffin has a social obligation or a social event, then I write all that stuff down too. And then once I have our entire kind of snapshot of the week on a piece of notebook paper, I can meal plan around that. Because I know if I have to work until six o'clock, my family is gonna be hungry around 545, and so I need a crock pot meal on that day. Or if I have an afternoon um, where I am getting the kids from school and I'm therefore going to be home at three o'clock, then I can make something that takes a little bit of time, like my family loves when I make guacamole. 
And so I might make something that I can add guacamole to because that takes me 10 or 15 minutes to make and I've got the extra time to make a condiment basically in order to add to our meal because I'm gonna be home for two and a half hours before dinner time. My family loves fish, but you really can't um, pre-make fish. And so I make fish on days that I'm gonna be home for a couple of hours before dinner time because I know I can, I can crank out the fish in that amount of time. <clears throat> and so I use my weekly plan to then plan our meals. And that has made us so efficient. That is the secret to cooking four or five weeknights per week for me, is really kind of knowing what I'm gonna make and when I'm going to make it. I also will batch cook. And so a lot of times on Sundays, I will be making, you know, kind of a double pot of spaghetti sauce or of chili or some kind of soup or meat. I even um, make more meatloaf and meatballs and I freeze those. I cook them first and then I... And so sometimes the meal has to just be pulling something out of the freezer, um, but I plan for that. I plan for the nights that I'm gonna pull something out of the freezer. And then having a freezer full of stuff definitely helps us account for days when we just don't have it together. And so we just have to defrost a um, bowl of chili for everybody and call it a day. And so that's the way that I plan our week, which then helps us plan our meals, which then helps me do my grocery list. That weekly planning is kind of a key to it all. Now, I take that weekly, that weekly plan and I mass communicate it to everybody. I literally just take a picture with my phone and I send that plan to anybody that's going to be in my house that week. So Brandon and Griffin always get the plan. Then I send it usually to my mom because she almost every week is helping us in some way, shape, or form. And then I send it to any babysitters that are coming and say something like, just confirming this week, looking forward to it. They all kind of know that they can, you know, ignore the rest of our stuff, but I need them there on Tuesday from two to four and can they please come? This is particularly helpful in the summer because most summers, while we hire kind of like a primary summer babysitter, we are also kind of filling in the gaps with other babysitters that, um, you know, are doing certain things because the regular babysitter has a, I don't know, a cold or a dentist appointment or, you know, how it goes. It's, it's, if it could be something consistent, we wouldn't need all of this help. So that kind of mass communication helps me because I think one of the hardest things about raising children is the communication. Because the doctor tells you one thing, you know, somebody's sick and so the doctor says, you gotta do these five things. And then you have to come home and you have to communicate about the doctor's appointment to your spouse and a grandparent and the regular babysitter and then the Tuesday babysitter that has to do the nebulizer and then the blah, 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 blah. And so if there's any notes like that, I also will write that down and it just kind of helps me to like jar the jar my memory in order to have those conversations with the Tuesday babysitter or whatever. And really, truly, the more that I communicate with these people, the more they kind of get into the groove of our normal routines. And I say, hey, you're family, and we are messy, and we are busy, and we want for you to know what's going on because you're helping us, and we really appreciate that. And the more I talk about what we're doing, the more involved you are going to be. Okay. So that's how I do my weekly plan, which then gets the groceries done. And that is super efficient. I always talk to friends about this. I thought I would share it with you. Something that has helped me quite a bit recently is making lists. Of course, people that are efficient make lists. But my list making has changed quite a bit since COVID kind of changed my efficiency um, uh, quota so significantly because I then had all of this added responsibility. Jack's back in school now and I still do this list making because it made me so efficient. So I have a list um, at my office of the projects that I need to accomplish for the day um, or for the week or like kind of long-term projects. 
So I usually have a list of what I need to do. I have a list of who, with whom I need to follow up. Just, you know, I sent something out and I haven't heard back from this person. So if I send something out and I'm waiting to hear back from them, I will just write them on my follow-up list um, with a little note about what they need to do or what I'm waiting on or whatever. Um, and then I have a list of kind of long-term projects. It might be, um, you know, something with a deadline that's 30 days out. Like in, in the legal world, I have um, discovery, like interrogatories and responses um, to requests for the production of documents. And I've got, you know, 20 or 30 days to respond to those things. Um, it might be just drafting an estate plan or something that doesn't have necessarily a deadline, but it's more project-based and it isn't preparing for some kind of meeting. Um, and then I've got projects that I wanna accomplish at home also, and so I usually have a list kind of a, at home of things that we wanna do or, um, you know, this is what I wanna accomplish this weekend, that kind of thing. Now, what was happening to me was I was getting super overwhelmed with my lists because um, my work life changed at the very beginning of COVID from working basically from eight until four every day to working in these like two hour chunks. You know, I might work only from one until three, but then I was available from seven to 10 p.m. And I would sit down at seven o'clock and I'd have this list that was, you know, as long as my arm. <laughs> and I would think, how am I gonna do all of this? And I would get super overwhelmed and, um, that overwhelm kind of shut me down. So it was like, okay, we need a better strategy. And so what I started doing is similar to my weekly plan where I planned my meals around my week, I would look at my weekly plan and say, okay, when are my hours to work this week? Because I can get probably 25 or 30 hours of work time in. I worked a lot on the weekends when we had Jack home from school. Um, but I would get, you know, a solid six hours to work during the weekend. And so I'm like, that's a big chunk of time. I can really accomplish a lot. So I started putting a post-it note on my desk for every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I would write the calendar as it was the day I was planning this for that week at the top. And then that helped me realize how much extra time I had in and I could kind of block projects into that time. So sometimes it was, I'm gonna answer these three emails, but sometimes it was these bigger projects or maybe a project for Ashley Barlow Company. It kind of all got put in, but I put it on this weekly plan. So I knew here's what I've got to accomplish on Monday. Here's what I've got to accomplish on Tuesday in order to stay up to date. What was very interesting about that to me was that I became so much less anxious about what I had to do and I actually accomplished far more than I thought I could accomplish in far less time. I was overestimating the amount of time things took me to do because I think prior to COVID, I probably sat at my desk a lot and just kind of like stared at the computer screen thinking, okay, I'm gonna get started. Okay, I'm gonna get it started. And so making lists in this way made me a lot more efficient. And I have statistics at my office that show me that I was 125% more efficient with this list making strategy than I was in the prior two years as they were averaged together. And those were really good years. And so this efficiency kind of um, led me to realize, oh, I need to do this all the time. I need to be this efficient. It actually kind of forced me to be more efficient. And what I do now, quite honestly, is I block time where I'm out of the office in order to kind of force it because I don't want to just sit at my computer and do nothing. So I'll go in the middle of the day and take a yoga class or I will say on a Sunday, you know what, I'm gonna tidy up the house for two hours in the morning because I wanna kind of force myself the need to be that efficient because why am I sitting at the office for an extra two hours just wasting time? So this list making is super duper helpful. It also kind of helps me to prioritize tasks and that's another piece of the list making that I think is super helpful. Prioritizing what's important. And so sometimes I would take my list and then I would just number, okay, I gotta do this. This is number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and then these are things that I can bump over to the next day if that helps. 
Because if it's all just in a stack in your desk, it's really hard to prioritize it. So having it on a post-it note and then being able to look at the post-it note and just think about it for five minutes at the, at the beginning of every day really helped me to prioritize. Okay, the next tip that I have is saying no. I left a very big obligation towards the beginning of COVID. It was something that my that is truly a passion for me. It is something that I absolutely loved. I love being a leader. I love helping in the disability community. I love interacting with friends and smart people. Um, I love helping organizations that I really care about. Um, and this obligation that I had kind of fit every single one of those things. However, there became a time when the stress of the obligation did not match up with where we could tolerate stress. We were very stressed about Jack's health. We were very stressed, as was the rest of the world, about COVID for, you know, no matter no matter where you fell on, on the feelings about COVID, it was stressful. Um, and then I had this added stress of this obligation that I had, this volunteer obligation. And so we had multiple family meetings about it. And finally, we said, you know what? We're going to say no. We are going to back out of this obligation because... We need to take our um, stress load and take the stress from that organization and we need to address that in other places in our personal and family lives. And so saying no is a huge opportunity to give you more time to be efficient, to be more efficient because I wasn't then spinning and worrying and thinking about um, all of the projects with this volunteer thing that I had, I could then take my time and energy and think about things at home. And so I was prioritizing basically where to put my stress. Now, some of this is good stress. You know, for me, planning things is really good stress. Leadership is really good stress. I love managing people and leading people and projects and that kind of thing. But still, even that good stress is stress. And if I need to spend my time and my energy and my efforts working on something at home or at my office, then I need to say no elsewhere. And so truly, I kind of now know, and I, and I think you have to just kind of know this by experience, where your threshold is and think, okay, I'm at my threshold and I have to say no to other things. I have to be able to um, decline opportunities or postpone opportunities and that sort of thing. Okay, another thing that we have learned um, throughout the years, basically raising kids, is that it's really important to create a framework for decision making. So decisions are going to come up. You know, do we um, join this sports team or do we not join this sports team? Do I take the offer from the IEP team on this particular issue um, or do I not take the offer? What if they said this? What if they said this? How would I feel about this? Um, are we going to go to that party? All of those things. I mean, it might be interesting to write down how many decisions you make in a day that aren't work related. How many decisions do you make as a parent or as a grandparent or somebody that um, loves a child that is on an IEP or a 504 plan? How many decisions do you make in a day? You would probably fill a piece of notebook paper with all of the decisions that you make, right? And so what we have had to do, I'm very logical, <laughs> is we've had to make frameworks for decision making. So here's an example that is school related, um, kind of school related, parent advocacy related. I used to do a whole lot with our PTO, a whole, whole lot. I was probably in our school, our elementary school, once per week. And there, of course, is, as there is any place, became some social, you know, it became a little socially stressful. Moms and dads kind of competing against one another or trying to weigh equities and um, social stress arose. 
And there was one particular day that I was organizing something and, um, you know, I was kind of in charge of an event and this like horrendously social stress, socially stressful um, event happened with one particular person. And I went home and I said to my husband, okay, so there I am working and I'm really tired. And, and I think when you're really tired, your mind gets more efficient. And you're like, all right, cut to the chase, Ashley. Here's how you need to address this. And so I came up with this concept that said, do I care about this friendship or this relationship with this other human enough to say, hey, I sense a little bit of stress between the two of us and I want to make sure that I haven't done anything. Um, and if I have, I want to be able to address it because I certainly didn't intend to offend you or to cause whatever the stress is. And so um, I, I, I'm here to listen what have I done? And I think that's a great strategy. But if you don't need that strategy, if the relationship is not one that you really need to foster, do I really want to keep this a friendship or is it maybe better as a kind of like co-working um, acquaintanceship, right? So do I care about this relationship enough to kind of address the conflict or should I just kind of ignore the conflict and do my job? And so my husband and I talked about it, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and we were like, nope, we don't really need this friendship, friendship in our lives. And maybe if we just put it at a distance, it can stay an acquaintanceship and it can be great. It can be a nice working relationship. And so that's what we did and it worked. And it has worked a thousand more times and in, in PTO in particular, it has worked in our personal lives. It has worked in my work relationships with clients and other attorneys and advocates and anybody else that comes into my office. That decision-making framework works for us socially. Do I, How do I feel about this relationship and where do I want this relationship to be? Do I want it to be a friendship? Do I want it to be, what kind of friendship do I want it to be? Is this the kind of friendship where I need to be able to share successes? Because if I need to be able to share successes, I need to be really present in order to receive successes from my friend. I need to be able to reciprocate that joy and that pride in my friend. Or is this the kind of friendship where we just do, you know, drinks twice a year and um, and it's just fun, it's shallow and it's fun and that's okay too. So what is the decision-making about that social relationship? The framework for decision-making is super important. I'll give you one more example quickly. So as we kind of ease back in from this um, COVID lifestyle, now our entire family's vaccinated um, and that was kind of the big thing that Jack's doctors told me we um, needed to wait for, so now what kind of um, activities are we comfortable with? What kind of gatherings are we comfortable with? And so one of the things for me, surprise, surprise, it comes down to control. And so I have said I'm comfortable with environments that I can control where they don't get socially weird. And so I'm not going to go to um, a party with um, people that are going to, with a bunch of people that are going to judge me if I just need to leave. Because I need to be able to control my environment and if I start to feel uncomfortable, then I need to be able to leave. If I start to feel like it is an unsafe environment for my family's um, values, then I need to be able to leave and if those are relationships that I care about um, and I feel like there's going to be judgment that comes in, then why put myself in that situation? I'm not going to go. We're just going to gracefully decline and say that we are um, not going to go. And so it's about controlling an environment and then how controlled the environment is. That's our decision making framework for how much socialization we are going to tolerate in this kind of like breaking free <laughs> of quarantine environment for the Barlow family. So creating a framework for decisions just makes us efficient. That way we don't have to talk about it all the time. We don't have to stew about it. I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and think about it. That's the way we're going to make decisions. We've committed to that and we're going to move forward. It makes it faster, makes it more efficient, gives me time to do other 
things. And then the last thing that I'll talk to you about is something that I am not super good at, but something that I have become far better at. And that is doing the things that are necessary to allow me to stay calm in the chaos. Doing things that keep me grounded so that I am present and able to make the decisions, able to make the lists, able to coordinate all of the people. Now, this has probably been the hardest lesson that I have learned as I kind of organize everything for our family. Because I used to just kind of run at this like super high paced, really kind of anxiety driven, um, frenzied pace. And I had to, um, I, like I said, I learned this the hard way because I was starting to have some like health stuff. Like I've got really bad jaw pain because I grind my teeth so significantly. And I kept getting sick one year because I wasn't sleeping because anxiety was keeping me up at night. I always tease that my mind is like the ticker on Times Square where I just lie down at night and it's like, oh, did I email this client? And shoot, this is due and I forgot to do it. And um, Griffin's got this stress with a friend and, oh, but he did really great at the swim meet. And, and things are just coming in and in and in and in and in. And, it, and it's like this revolving door of thoughts. And so I had to work very hard on um, kind of controlling that and addressing that so that I could be more present in order to make more decisions. Because if I'm kind of running at that high pace, then I can't even sit down to make the, the weekly schedule that's going to save us or to um, cook because I'm so stressed out with all of the things that we have to do. And so the keys for me, one is exercising. Exercising is very grounding for me. And in a very literal sense, if I knew much less about OT because, you know, if I didn't have Jack and I didn't have to do this for him, um, I would just say I have to kind of exhaust myself to the point that I can be present. It's kind of like the way you feel when you take Dayquil, Dayquil or Benadryl. I need to exercise that much so that I then can be present because if I have too much energy, I'm not going to get anything done. I just kind of spin. And so I have to exercise regularly. I also know that in my case, I have to sweat in order to kind of process my adrenal hormones. Otherwise, my body doesn't really dump adrenal stress hormones. And so I've got to sweat those things out. I'm recovering from the flu. Um, and I made it to day five without exercising. And, and I said to my husband yesterday, I am so um, kind of icky and garbagey feeling from the flu. I think I just need to go take a really quick run so that I can sweat for 20 minutes and see if I feel any better. I'll, I'll report back and let you know if it helped, but I think I just needed to start getting some of that gunk out of me and sweating is what helps. Eating well certainly helps, and I am sure that eating well helps um, the whole process, but it also um, just giving myself the opportunity to feed myself and to nourish myself and to care for myself has the psychological effect of, um, of helping me to focus on myself to keep myself healthy. So I'm sure there's physical benefits too, but there's also kind of that mind-body um benefit. And then of course, sleeping, you know, we're all more efficient if we get more sleep. My body these days makes me go to sleep at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and it makes me wake up at six o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, if I'm not getting good sleep, then I definitely am less efficient. So Take those tips for what they're worth. If you um, heard any of them and they speak to you, I implore you, I encourage you to put them into action in your house. I hope it's helpful. I am not an expert on this topic at all, but um, you know, I've had this conversation with enough people and I oftentimes am, I suppose, complimented might be the right word for how efficient I am, even though, as I said, um, 
it's really about <laughs> balancing the chaos. Um, and so I thought I would share them with you during this really busy month. If this is the last podcast you get to in the month of December, I will go ahead and wish you very happy holidays. I will be back next week, all things considered, so long as we don't get the flu again or something else. Um, Next week, same time, same place. I hope to see you there.